Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. The God of Israel is a dependable God. Once one enters into a covenantal relationship with Him, God is there to help, to assist, to deliver, and do exactly what His covenantal responsibilities are. And He has demonstrated that over and over with the nation of Israel. We have seen how He has moved to help, deliver, and bring about the fulfillment of His will for His people. But what did Israel do? Israel was quick to forget God's goodness to them. Now, there are those that would then point the finger at Israel simply to say bad things. But in reality, Israel is not so unique. This tendency to be forgetful of the things of God, what God has done to bless us, help us, This is a human tendency, not unique to Israel, but we all are guilty of it. Therefore, we should look at scriptures such as this and be quick to identify ourselves in a similar way. Well, take out your Bible and let's look at the portion of scripture that we're going to study today. Look with me to the book of Psalms and Psalm 106. The book of Psalms and Psalm 106. Now, it begins in a wonderful way with that Hebrew term, hallelujah, which simply means praise the Lord. And here, Yah is an abbreviated form of that sacred name. So we read in verse 1, praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, for good is He, for His grace is endures forever now i've made mention to you that this word forever it is a word olam in hebrew it is connected to the kingdom it is a word that is used as an adjective to describe the kingdom quality the kingdom is forever the kingdom will encompass all things all of god's creation Through his redemption, he will turn all of his creation into the kingdom of God. And what is the key aspect of that kingdom? Grace. It is because God is a gracious God that he will bring about a kingdom fulfillment. So his grace endures forever. Verse 2. We have a question in verse 2. Who? And in this use of this word, it is an encouragement. It is asking people to do just that. Who will utter? And then we have the word for mighty things, the mightiness. It's in the plural, the abundance of God's mightiness. So who will utter the mighty things of the Lord and cause to be heard? Now, it's a word, yeshmiah. Yeshmiah comes from a word that most of us are familiar with, the word Shema, to hear. But in this grammatical construction, it's in the Hif'il, which means to cause to be heard. And it's in the future. So literally, who will make known? Who will cause to be heard all of his praise? Now, what is being taught here? Because God is abundant in mighty acts, we should be likewise continuously making known his praise to others. Verse 3, blessed are the ones, it's in the plural, so blessed is the one who keeps justice. And keeping justice is necessary 
for the righteousness of God to be manifested. And in many different places in the scripture, we see that expression, to keep justice. So blessed, and this word blessed, ashray, can also be happy. So when we keep justice, when we are an instrument to execute justice in this world, and of course justice according to God's standards, it is going to produce blessing and happiness among the person. And notice what it says. Oh, say, the one who does, does righteousness at all time, at every instant. Here again, we see the relationship between justice being done and righteousness being manifested. There's always that close relationship between justice and righteousness. In fact, in many languages, we only have one word for that. In English and Hebrew, we have two. In Greek, there's only one for both justice and righteousness. Look on to verse 4. Again, God's love, God's faithfulness, God's provision, God's help is not only to a group, but also to the individual. Notice what is said here. The psalmist is speaking and he says, Remember me, O Lord. And then we have a word, Ratzon. Ratzon can be desire or it can be the word will. So remember me in the will of your people. Meaning this psalmist wants to fulfill and receive what is the will of God to carry it out, to be committed to it, and to be a recipient of God's will for his people. And what is that will? Well, if we keep reading, it talks about that God, he has visited me. And this is a word, this word for visit, it's the same word for depositing, placing something in a specific location. And this word speaks of God being all in, his full commitment. And what is he fully committed to? Well, notice what it says. Be Yeshua Techa, salvation, your salvation. So the psalmist is asking for God to move in fullness, in a complete way to be all in, in causing him to receive the reward or the will of God which ultimately is salvation. And what is salvation? Salvation is that victory that comes from being in God's will, accomplishing God's will, and becoming the recipient of God's will. Verse 5. To see the goodness of your chosen ones. Now, some Bibles will say the word elected ones, and that's fine. When you understand the word elect is simply being chosen. And here again, you have Reformed theologians, I'm speaking to Calvinists, that want to bring a lot more than the Word of God refers to with this choice. Because Judaism understands this election. Yes, it's part of God's plan, His purposes, His will. But this election is only relevant for covenantal members so you have to enter into that covenant and like abraham did by faith in order to be the elect of the lord to be chosen by him and notice it's to see goodness and goodness having to do with the will of god it's those who are in a covenant that can expect that god is going to move god is going to work in order to bring about the fulfillment of his covenant promises to his covenant people. And then the last part of verse 5 deals with to rejoice in the gladness of your nation. Now, this nation that is referring to is the nation that, that comes into that Abrahamic covenant. It all goes back to a verse of scripture that is so significant. I'm speaking about Genesis chapter 12 and that section within verses 1 through 3 where we have the Abrahamic covenant. And what do we know? Well, we know that God's promise is to make a people that comes from Abraham 
going from Abraham to Yitzchak, Yitzchak to Yaakov, and the descendants of Yaakov, to make them into what it says in Hebrew, Goy Gadol, a great nation, or a great people, depending upon how your Bible translates it. And here's what's important. This term Goy, well, if you ask most people, they will say, this is a word for Gentile. But it's simply a word that refers to a people, the people that God is going to bring into the Abrahamic covenant, and they are going to be the recipients of the Abrahamic covenant. So when we see here and look at this passage, when it talks about experiencing, now it's a word, lerot, to see. But in this context, it's an experiential word, to see or experience the goodness of, of your chosen ones and these chosen ones remember it has to do with a covenant they are going to rejoice with the gladness of your nation your people meaning they're going to have instilled upon them the outcome of God's covenantal responsibilities they are going to reap that and notice what it says it says at the end of the verse and to praise with your inheritance now this is a word nahala it is a word that refers to inheriting something that which is belonging to god your inheritance that you're going to bestow it upon your covenant people because they have entered into a covenant with you and because you are faithful to your covenantal promises verse six now god has and what has been outlined for us is that God has this wonderful plan that is in his will is goodness. In his will is his inheritance. He wants to bring about all of his covenantal obligations to his covenantal people. But notice what happens. Look at this next verse, verse 6. We have sinned with our forefathers. We have done iniquity and we have behaved wickedly now at least there's that confession at least there's that acknowledgement of what has been done the scripture outlines god has a great will a great purpose for his people he wants to use them god's faithful to move and we'll see other instances other examples of god being faithful but what is the response we have sinned as our forefathers we have done iniquity and we have behaved wickedly and then it gives example look at verse 7 our fathers in egypt they did not and this is a word for for understanding it's a word for behaving having knowledge to behave in a successful way doing the things that god has instructed so it simply tells us that in egypt that they were not wise or discerning of your wondrous deeds now in this passage of scripture psalm 106 we're going to see in the next few verses god's faithfulness to do these wondrous things what is spoken of earlier as these mighty acts that for some reason we have a tendency to forget we do not allow we are rebellious and rebellion is going to be listed as a problem we are rebellious against what we should know god has manifested his faithful character his gracious character to us he has done wondrous things but we tend not to remember them so we have not behaved wisely with understanding in order to bring about success even though you have done these wondrous things look at the second part of verse verse 7 they did not remember the abundance of your graciousness and here the word grace is in the plural so we did not remember the abundance of your grace but grace is in the plural and what happened well notice it says they rebelled at the sea what sea yam suf the red sea 
Now, what was this rebellion? It did not, they did not trust in God. God didn't bring them out of Egypt for destruction. See, this is the problem. When the people found that the armies of Pharaoh were pursuing them, they, they lost all hope. They, they, they did so in a way that was most insulting to God. That God brought them out to this place in order to destroy them? No, he did not. He brought them to that location knowing that Pharaoh would pursue and in order to bring about an end to the Egyptian army and to destroy Pharaoh in that sea. But the people doubted God. Verse 8. But he saved them, and this is word for making them to be saved. He caused them to be saved. Why? Here's what's so important. On account of his name. Now, we're going to see, if you look at end-time prophecy, it is not believers that are going to, to be the catalyst to bring Israel to faith. We're called to do that, but we are going to fail. We're not going to do it before the end, our end in this world comes about. I'm speaking about the end that will take place with the rapture. We're not going to accomplish what, what we're called to do. In fact, as we see today, to a large degree that we are not uh, uh, taking possession of this world, inheriting it, and bringing about a righteous change in this world, quite the contrary. The opposite is going to happen. We are going to be overcome by the enemy. That's what the book of Revelation says in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 7. But being overcome isn't the end because we have resurrection promise we are going to overcome we might lose our life but there's going to be new life eternal life and with that is victory and this is what god's promising in verse 8 when he says and he saved them on account of his name to make known his mightiness second time this world word appeared his mightiness his strength verse 9 and what did he do in making known that he was the mighty god the mighty god verse 8 or verse 9 he rebuked the red sea and it dried up and he led them on the dips the depths meaning on the very bottom of the sea he led them on the depths of the sea as on a desert meaning this in the same way and the word here is the word midbar in the same way that he led them in the desert on dry land he also led them to cross the yam Suf, the sea of reeds the red sea it was just the same way he brought it about having dried it up for them in a unique way verse 10 now we see this same word again. And he saved them from the hand of the one who hates. And the implication is hated Israel. And he redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. So this is what God does. God redeems. God delivers. God assists us to overcome. Now, the point I want to emphasize here is that our God is faithful to deliver us from those who hate us and those who are our enemies. God is able to do that. He was faithful. And how did he do it? Well, look at verse 11 where it says, they were covered with water. Who was covered? Their enemies were covered with water. And not one from them remained. Not one from the enemy was left. It was a total victory from Israel's standpoint. A total loss from the Egyptian standpoint. And it all came about, we know the story. God simply moved and brought those waters upon the Egyptian armies. Why? Well, Israel crossed because they had a covenantal promise. 
The Egyptians did not. And when you do not have a covenantal relationship with God, your, your future is that of devastation. So again, their enemies, he covered with water. And also, we see that not one of them remained. And at that time, what happened? Something good. If you read carefully about the crossing and the victory of the Red Sea, you will see that that brought faith to the people. And this is what it says here. Vayaminu bidivarav. And they believed in his words. And they sung his praise. But again, that was something that was wonderful, something that was proper, but something that was short-lived. They soon forgot. And this is exactly what the scripture says. Look now to verse 13. They quickly forget his deeds. This is the problem. In order to have faith, we need to remember. And how do we remember? By valuing this book, by studying this book, by remembering what God has done. There is a long history of God's faithfulness to move, to deliver, to assist, to help, to, to cause, to overcome, and ultimately to experience salvation. And frequently, this word salvation is related to victory. This is who the God of Israel is. But what is this human tendency? Israel demonstrated, not because it's Israel, but because they're human as well. They quickly forgot his deeds, and they did not wait for his counsel, meaning they went alone. They acted according to what they thought was right. And when we do not behave based upon the counsel of God, his instruction, his revelation, well, the outcome is going to be devastating. Now, when we're not in that right relationship with God, we're going to think incorrectly. And let me say that that is a problem with, with many people, many believers as well. We don't think properly. We, we don't rely upon his counsel, being aware of how dependent we are upon his revelation. And what happens? Well, look at verse 14. When we are not motivated by God's instructions, let me say it in a different way. When we are not committed to the commandments of God. See, we find the counsel of God. We find discernment. We find God's revelation in his commands in two ways. First of all, they're generally revelation. They instruct us what to do and what not to do. But here's the key. When we do them, the doing of them is going to bring discernment, understanding, and a kingdom perspective to us. And if we don't do them, what's going to happen? Then our desires are going to dominate. And a very strong word for human desire is the word lust. Look at verse 14. They lusted a lust in the desert now again this is a word midbar and this word midbar whenever it appears in the scripture it comes within the context of trusting god depending upon god believing god but they didn't do that they lusted after their own desires they had a great lust and what did they do they tested the lord at, and this is another word for a desert, a wilderness, a place where there's no provision. So they tested the Lord. And God is good. He is gracious. He gave to them their requests. Now, the context here in the desert is that they wanted meat to eat. And what does the scripture say? Vai shalach razon be nafsham and he sent razon razon 
Some Bibles will say that it means that which is lean. Now, some will talk about wasting away, and they'll see this as a disease, but literally, this is what it is. It is the same word where we get the English word to be thin, to be uh, malnourished. And what it's saying is this, lust will never provide for us what we lust for is never a good thing it is never something that is going to bless us in fact it's going to cause us to waste away when we get what we want it is going to have an adverse effect upon us and notice the last word be nafsham among their souls meaning inwardly it's going to have an adverse effect upon us spiritually and what did they begin to do rebel rebel against a godly leader it says here they they were envious of moses in the camp so when they were there they wanted to be moses they didn't want to submit to his authority and likewise to aharon aaron his brother this one who was sanctified of the lord put in this place they desired to be like them not in a good way but wanting to replace them and they rebelled against them and therefore in this rebellion and we're starting to talk about a specific rebellion it's found in the book of uh, numbers at chapter 16 and we're talking about the merit the rebellion of korach and what does it say concerning that look at verse 17 the earth open meaning open its mouth and swallowed and we have an individual datan and it covered up the congregation of aviram and aviram is another one datan and aviram is mentioned they are mentioned with uh korach and that rebellion in the book of numbers and because of their their rebelliousness what happened judgment it says fired burned against their congregation flames uh, burnt up the wicked ones and so god brings judgment he's faithful to be gracious to be kind to to move us to help us to assist us to bring us victory but when we are lustful and our context here is doing what we want pursuing our desires not relying upon the counsel the instruction the commands of god but doing it our way it's going to bring about judgment look now to verse 19 and it's going to have as well an adverse uh, outcome upon us spiritually it says here and they made a calf in horev horev is sinai and we all know about the incident with the golden calf that's what we're speaking about here they made a calf in horev and they bowed down to that which was molten and notice the outcome of that it says they exchanged now this is a word if you have uh currency money in one uh type of of foreign currency you want to exchange it you want to convert it to the currency that you can use and this is the same word here it has to do with change exchanging and they exchange their glory what does that mean well there's two interpretations they replace god they didn't want the god of israel they didn't want the real god they replaced him with this uh, golden calf that which was molten so they exchange and the other view is this when we're in god's will he leads us into glory we are going to be brought into his presence but instead of experiencing his presence it says what did they have they had the the uh, uh golden calf in the shape of an ox a thing that eats grass they were worshiping that which simply eats grass not something that is truly god and again what does he say look at verse 21 they forgot god their savior 
This is who we're forgetting. This is who we're forsaking. This is who we're replacing. God wants to move us into victory where we can receive the good inheritance that he has for us, a kingdom inheritance, where there's blessing, where there's his promises, where there is goodness. And what do we do? We forget God. We, we begin to rely upon our own understanding. We fall into idolatry, a deceitful thing, trying to get what we want in a, a religious way. And it doesn't go well. Look at verse 22, 21. They forget God, their Savior. The one who does great things in Egypt. Now, Egypt sometime is related to the world. Now, if we look at this, we see two things that stand out. If you look at this 21, 21st verse, at the end it says, Ose. Ose is in the present tense. So it's referring to one who does, does great things. It's in the plural. Great things in Egypt. Well, it's not putting it in the past. It's using Egypt for a reference to the world. And God still is doing great things in the world. But we have to be in his covenant. And I'm speaking now about that new covenant. And we have to be in his will. We need to be committed to his purposes, his justice, his righteousness. We need to remember how God has been faithful in the past. And walk and live in his grace. And then we can experience this great things look at our last verse last verse is verse 22 where it says speaking of these great things niflaot niflaot are wondrous things things that go beyond human comprehension we we can't understand how god brought these wonderful things about but we are the recipient of them the benefit offenders of them we benefit from them and it says the wondrous things in the land of Ham. And this word Ham is a synonym, according to all the commentators, for as well Egypt. Egypt was the prime place where Ham was. And it says here the awesome things, and it's the word Nora. Nora can mean terrible, it was terrible for the enemy. But it was awesome for God's covenant people. And God, what the scripture is saying is that God will do awesome things for his people. As he did where? As he did at Yam Suf, at the sea, at the Red Sea. So again, we see God is faithful. God is gracious. God is generous. God is our savior. He will deliver us from our enemies. He will position us where he knows we need to be so we can do the things that are going to bring us into intimacy into the very presence of god but what is our tendency no sooner that we are a benefactor from one of god's blessing that we benefit from one of god's blessings what do we do we're quick to forget we're quick to go and behave so-called religiously in our estimation how we see things and when we rely upon our own understanding and hear this whenever you make your own decisions you are going to be deceived by the enemy it is only when we rely upon the instructions of god the commandments of god the word of god then and only then is that word going to shape our thoughts we're going to receive that counsel from the Lord so that we have discernment, we choose wisely, and we reap the benefits of God. That is His way, and God will not change it. We need to conform to His framework. He's not going to conform to us. His way is right. Our way leads to destruction, We will be deceived and brought right in by the enemy. And believe us, there are enemies against us. And it's only through his word that we're going to be brought into 
victory, a kingdom victory. Well, I'll close with that until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.